Welcome back to the New Year. Happy New Year, everyone, and welcome to yet another in our public engagement lecture series about Vikings. Today, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce Professor Judith Yesh, who may be, and probably is, the only professor of Viking studies in the entire world. <laughs> um, although she's sometimes called a historian or an archaeologist, Actually, she's neither of those, but is rather an expert on Old Norse texts and has a particular interest in runic inscriptions and poetry, and the, basically the texts of the Vikings that they themselves wrote. Her two most recent books are Viking Poetry of Love and War, a collection aimed at the general reader, and The Viking Diaspora, a more academic study of the consequences of the Viking Age. So, both well worth reading, and I shall just not go on too long and hand you straight over to Judith. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely to see you all. Um, and on this cold and wind, wet and windy and very Viking sort of day. Um, I can only just hear you. Mike. You can only just hear me. Yes. Um, have you got your, your loop? Um, that, that isn't helping me. It isn't helping you. Okay, um, I'll do my best. Uh, it's true that uh, 32 years ago when I got the job here at the interview, they said, Dr. Yesh will give you the job, but you'll have to learn to speak up. <laughs> and I've done my best over the years, but <laughs> sometimes I, I slip. Okay, um, I want to today just throw out some ideas about uh, some of these words on the slide. So. Uh, we generally tend to think about of the Vikings as warriors, as invaders, um, but what happened afterwards? Um, and that's where words like immigration and integration come into it. Um, first, let's look at uh, the Viking phenomenon. It's often portrayed in this sort of way. Um, this is just a random map I found somewhere, um, probably on the internet. And you have all these very sort of aggressive arrows coming out of Scandinavia in different directions. So yellow Swedes, blue Danes, and red, the particularly aggressive red Norwegians. Um, and the arrows all go one way. They come out of Scandinavia and go to these different places. So uh, here we are in England, um, in the British Isles, and people who live on islands are perhaps more worried about invasion um, than uh, many other people. And you may have seen recently there was this program. Um, again, the Vikings there in the background, those guys in that boat don't look like they could do very much damage, but uh, <laughs> the idea is that, yes, the Vikings were one of a whole series of invaders who've invaded uh, this country. Um, actually, uh, we're all invaders because 18,000 years ago, this country was under ice. So everyone is an immigrant. That's something I tell my students all the time. Um, just, just remember that. So um, this is the question. Vikings, uh, violent warriors like these two chaps here, um, and then uh, invade, and then afterwards, uh, the process of immigration happens, and then gradually integration. So somehow. Uh, these uh, Scandinavian warriors have come over here, people have uh, integrated with them, and gradually they've been assimilated into the population, and they have a nice uh, typical Viking family. That's, and this is what many scholars, the kind of process uh, that many scholars see as happening. So I'm not going to concentrate on uh, these warrior guys and on questions of invasion, but on what happened possibly after uh, the so-called invasions. I'm also wanting uh, to remind people about what happens when people move from one place to another. Um, and I'm sure out of all the people in this room, if you were born in this country, how many of you have a parent, a grandparent, or a great-grandparent who was born in another country? Okay, quite a few. Um, and some of them may have been born in another country where they spoke a different language um, or had a different religion or had a different legal system. And this is what immigrants bring with them. This is just some of the things that immigrants uh, bring. 
And then what ha tends to happen, and it's happened over and over and over again in the history of these islands, is that gradually people lose their original language and start speaking the language of the place they've come to. They take up new names, um, they take up perhaps a new religion, uh, they uh, adhere to a new legal system, um, they, bring, they bring their own food, but sometimes some of these things stay on. So we all eat curry, um, and 100 years ago nobody knew uh, what curry was. Curry was brought here by <coughs> immigrants. And the same processes happen uh, at all periods. So what I want to find out is what happened in the Viking Age with these kinds of everyday things, things that affected people's lives. Now, we don't have evidence for everything, um, but these are the kinds of things that will tell us a little bit about what happened when people of Scandinavian origin came and settled down in this country. Um, can you still hear me okay? Uh, most, of the most of the time, just checking. Do wave <laughs> if you can't. Okay. Um, so, uh, we have place names and personal names, and many of you will have been here for Rebecca Gregory's lecture on place names, so you know a little bit about that already. We have uh, language and inscriptions. We have female jewelry in particular, which I think is uh, especially interesting. Um, we have sculpture, mainly of a Christian nature. Um, and a lot of what we have in these categories is actually not so much Scandinavian. It's not so much what people have brought with them, but something that we can call Anglo-Scandinavian um, jewelry or sculpture or even some linguistic things, as you saw in some of the hybrid place names that Rebecca Gregory talked about. We can call them Anglo-Scandinavian. They're a merging of the two cultures. So that's uh, the kind of evidence we have. I'm not going to um, talk about all of these because um, I haven't really got time. I'm just going to pick out a few aspects of um, the evidence that shows us what happens to these Scandinavian immigrants uh, in Britain, but it, particularly here in the East Midlands. And I've set myself a really difficult task because <laughs> there's actually very little evidence compared to some other parts of the Viking world. Um, as many of you know, normally I work with things like Icelandic sagas, um, and in Iceland it's very easy to study the impact of uh, the Viking settlement because it was an empty country before the Vikings arrived. Um, and then so everything in Iceland owes its origins to uh, the Viking Age. Here in England, it was a, an established country. There were indigenous inhabitants. And because of that assimilation process I mentioned earlier, it's not always easy to find out uh, what happened to the Scandinavian immigrants. Right, so I, and I am going to concentrate on um, Nottingham itself and the five boroughs, which I'll come back to in a moment. Um, does everyone recognize this picture? Yeah. It's in the council house. Oh, good, you've all been looking up <laughs> when you're in the council house. Um, it's actually extremely difficult to photograph because it's very high up, um, but if you, if you can just about make out that there's a Viking ship there and, and a horned helmet Viking. Um, and I find it very interesting. The council house was built in 1929, and obviously when the city council uh, chose to have these oil paintings made for the cupola, um, they chose four different events in the history of Nottingham. The Danes conquering Nottingham in the year 864 AD, William the Conqueror, uh, Robin Hood, and Charles I <laughs> raising his standard. So uh, three historical events and one legend, shall we say. <laughs> and I find it fascinating that nowadays, as far as I can make out, the only one of those four the council is still interested in is Robin Hood. <laughs> So I'm on a mission. If anyone has any contacts in the city council or the county council, tell them forget all that Robin Hood stuff. Um, let's have some real history here. Let's have Vikings instead. Anyway, uh, so I've laid my cards on the table there. Right, so um, I just want to pick out a few milestones in uh, the history of the East Midlands in the Viking Age. And uh, an important uh, reference is this reference in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle um, in 868. 
The great heathen army, as it's called, this is an army of Vikings, traveled back and forth across the country, and in that particular year they came into Mercia, Mercia being one of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms of the time. So what we would today call the East Midlands and the West Midlands together are basically uh, what Mercia was. And they took up winter quarters here. The king of the Mercians, a certain Burgred, um, wasn't, didn't feel able to cope with the situation, so he called in uh, King Alfred and his brother Ethelred to help out. They brought an army and besieged the fortress. Um, but interestingly, it says there occurred no serious battle there, and the Mercians made peace with the enemy. So it seems to have been a bit of a damp squib. Okay, all these uh, ferocious, scary Vikings came, but nothing much happened, and they decided to get along together, um, I think, is how I would read that. Um, then it's after, after that period that we assume that many of the settlements took place, uh, giving rise to the place names that uh, Rebecca uh, was talking about uh, before Christmas. Um, and so we assume that members of the army and then possibly also other people coming in their wake uh, settled down in the various villages of the region. Now, in, um, in the meantime, there was... Um, uh, following on from the successes of, of King Alfred, the, the Wessex dynasty, so those uh, southerners uh, trying to take over the whole of the country, and Alfred's son, Edward the Elder, came to Nottingham in 918, captured the borough, um, ordered it to be repaired, and manned with both English and Danes. Um, and then everyone in Mercia submitted to him, and it's interesting that everyone in Mercia is conceived of as English people and Danish people. So there seems to be a situation where we have these two groups um, living together in Mercia and acting together, really, acting together to man, man the garrison and acting together um, when they choose to submit to the King of Wessex. Um, and if you've been to the lace market, as I'm sure most of you have, you'll have seen this rather... Um, old sign showing you uh, the extent of what he is here called the late Saxon borough, but this is what we're talking about, the Anglo-Saxon and Viking part of Nottingham, which is kind of centered around that area uh, around St. Mary's Church. Um, and it's the Nottingham only expanded in that direction after the Norman Conquest. So um, we don't know much about uh, that period in Nottingham's history, there were some excavations which we're still waiting for the publication of uh, f 40 or 50 years down the line, um, but they, they, I think they are slowly happening. Um, and no doubt one day we'll, we'll find out more. And then uh, another occasion on which Nottingham is mentioned in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is in this... Um, entry for 942, which, although it doesn't look like it here, is actually a poem. Um, and if you go to the Dane Law Saga exhibition, uh, I'm sure you've all been, but if you haven't, you must go now. Um, and if you've been but haven't lifted up one of the telephones in there, then do, because you can hear uh, this poem read in Old English and in Modern English translation. And it's a poem about Edmund, now the son of Edward the Elder, um, reca recapturing, I think, or capturing uh, the five boroughs. And this is the first time that the five boroughs are mentioned. So Derby, Leicester, Lincoln, Nottingham, and Stamford. Um, we don't know how these five boroughs came about, but they are five towns which were ruled by the Vikings, um, by the uh, members of the heathen army and their successors. Um, and what the poem suggests, and there is some evidence for, is that during the period before this, there had been some incursions from the north. So the Vikings based in Yorkshire, north of the Humber, in the kingdom of Viking Kingdom of York, had tried to take over uh, the area south of the Humber. And what the poem does is present King Edmund as rescuing these poor little Danish inhabitants. Note, uh, the Danes were previously subjected by force under the Norsemen. So it seems to be making a distinction between these, the nice 
Danes of uh, the Midlands and those nasty Norwegian <coughs> Vikings uh, north of the Humber, who are, um, and they're also uh, described as heathens, so they held uh, those nice Danes in the bonds of captivity. Um, so, so, as I say, this is our first reference to the five boroughs. This seems to be um, an important confederation of towns, uh, four of which later became county towns, and indeed it's probably at this time that the counties as we know them evolved. Um, and this map shows you the area we're talking about. We can call it the East Midlands. Um, and uh, you can see, as well as Nottingham, a couple of other important uh, places on this map, uh, Repton here and Torxey there, which are also important sites where the uh, great heathen army camped. Uh, and again, you can see, read about those, see about those in, in the Dane Law Saga exhibitions. So and Nottingham is very much, it's on the Trent, uh, as are both of those very much a part of what's going on in the region at the time. And you can see according to this map anyway, I don't think this is entirely correct, but anyway, um, in the Kingdom of York, uh, they've they, they, whoever made this map decided that there were Norse settlements, i.e. Norwegian, uh, in, the, in the west and Danish in the east. I think it was a bit more complicated than that. Um, and indeed, there's some evidence, as we'll see, of possibly uh, Norwegian settlements further south. So that's um, the region we're talking about at this period. Um, and it seems to fit in um, with this map. I'm going to keep showing you this map because this is how most people imagine the Viking Age. We've had these, these nice little Danes come and settle here. We've had those nasty heathen Norwegians coming with their red arrows and, and making trouble for everybody. Um, but then somehow it all gets sorted by that wise and wonderful English king, and that's the end of it. Um, I would like to suggest that the situation is a little bit more complicated than that, and that uh, the settlers in the East Midlands had, uh, weren't just nice, well-behaved Danes who, who, who did everything the king told them to do, but actually still had their contacts with uh, their cousins throughout the Viking world. And what I call the Viking world is uh, this, just everything really, uh, everywhere where these arrows go to. So places that people from Scandinavia have been to. So all the way to Iceland and indeed further away to, all, to North America, uh, all around Britain and Ireland, um, but also a little bit on the European continent. And then east to Russia, I'm going to ignore uh, the eastern connections for today because they're not ter terribly relevant for what I'm talking about. But it's always important to remember that uh, the Viking Age also sh uh, saw a great expansion into uh, what is now Russia. So, um, and I'm going to look at two kinds of uh, connections that uh, the Viking settlers of the East Midlands had. One is, first of all, uh, in the period immediately after the settlements, to what extent they had connections with the rest of this Viking world. And then I'm also going to look at, in a slightly longer historical period as what happened after that. Were they still in touch uh, with um, either uh, the rest of the Viking world or the homelands that they came from. Did they still feel Scandinavian? Um, the, in the 10th century, that's only less, less than 100 years after they first arrived, one can imagine that uh, the immigrants still might have kept their language, their naming customs, their dress, uh, possibly, uh, maybe not their food, it's more difficult, um, possibly their burial customs. And then how long does it take for an immigrant to lose all of those? Um, what is the process by which you lose it? Is it because um, you marry a local, for example, or is it because your children just don't, oh, we don't want to speak that old language of grandma anymore? Um, it's a, a something you still see nowadays. So first of all, I'm just going to look at what happened in the first period, and I'm only going to give some a few examples. I can't cover everything. So first of all, I'm going to look at 10th century connections between the East Midlands and the rest of the Viking world. 
And then I'm going to look at some continuing connections after the 10th century. Um, just two little examples. These are both recent metal detectorist finds. Um, there are quite a few of these about, and they're generally called Norse bells. You can see they're very small. Um, they're made of copper alloy. Um, we don't really know what <laughs> they are, except that they seem to be bells. Most of them have lost their suspension loops and their clappers. Um, and, but I think they're terribly interesting. And here I'm relying on a, a recent article by Schoenfelder and Richards on these. Uh, um, but these finds are actually more recent than that article. So there, we may still change our picture of what these actually mean. Um, they seem to be from the 10th century, as far as we can tell. Now, obviously, uh, metal detectorist finds are often undateable, but some have been found in archaeological contexts, so it is possible to assign a date to them. Um, their function is un completely uncertain, although uh, Schoenfelder and Richards make a suggestion, which is fascinating but unprovable, I think, that they were worn by high-status women for the purposes of ostentation. So um, rings on her fingers and bells on her toes, she shall have music wherever she goes, I think is what they're imagining here. Why would <laughs> you want to go around jingling all the time? I don't know. Um, but that's their suggestion. I don't know whether that's true or not. But if it is, again, it brings up the whole question of the role of women in this process of immigration and integration, which is, I think, a very important one. Um, what I think is interesting about them is their distribution. And it's always distribution that's relevant. There's absolutely nothing Scandinavian about these bells. They are just very plain copper alloy, tiny little bells. They are not found in Scandinavia. So what is it that makes them Viking? It's their distribution that makes them Viking. They're found in all those areas of the Viking world that I showed you on that map. Scotland, the Isle of Man, Wales, Ireland, even Iceland and England. So they're somehow, they seem to be a new cultural phenomenon, whatever their function was, that arises in this very mobile world of the Vikings, where people are kind of whizzing around uh, from one place to another. So people are in contact with other people of Viking origin, whether it's in Iceland or the Isle of Man or the Hebrides. Um, and that's, I think, the context. In so this is a fashion among these people. It doesn't seem to have spread uh, to the indigenous uh, peoples of England, for example, or indeed uh, Ireland or, or Scotland. Uh, it is the Scandinavians who are using these bells in whatever way they're using. So I think that just, just a very small example shows that uh, the people in the East Midlands are linked to all the, other, the, all the others uh, around the Viking world. Uh, another phenomenon which has a, a similar, although not identical, distribution, um, and which I think is very interesting, is uh, what we call hogbacks. Now, this is a, quite a contentious subject, um, quite a lot of... Uh, they're fascinating monuments, and they're much debated. Uh, I want to start with looking at their distribution on these two maps. You can see that in England, um, there's one concentration in the northeast of England, one in the northwest. Um, then there's a kind of trickle down here. And then, according to Jim Lang, at any rate, um, uh, there is a little concentration here down in the East Midlands, uh, Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire. Uh, they also appear in Scotland. <coughs> Um, the ones in the uh, southeast of Scotland are perhaps closely related to the ones in, in the north of England. And then there's a scatter uh, in the far north of Scotland, Orkney and the Hebrides. Right, so what is a hogback? Well, they come in many shapes and sizes. Um, there are quite a large number of them. Um, they vary enormously, which... Uh, gives the scholars plenty of fun in arguing over what is a hogback and what is not a hogback. Um, and here are just some of the uh, clearer examples. 
Uh, the top left is from Gosforth in Cumbria. Uh, that one is from Sockburn in County Durham. And these, uh, these are from Brompton in North Yorkshire. And those are from Lythe in North Yorkshire. They are probably grave monuments, so put on, plonked on someone's grave. Um, they're found associated with churches, but we don't know whether the graves underneath them would have been Christian or not. There's nothing obviously Christian about most of them. They're called hogbacks because many of them have this shape, which is a bit like the back of a hog, I suppose. Um, or sometimes they're called house-shaped monuments. They do seem to imitate the shape of Viking Age houses. Uh, many of them have these uh, what seem to be tiles on their uh, top, so li the, like the uh, tiles on the roof of a house. Um, and then many of them, um, some of them have interesting images, like the, the Gosforth one, which has two armies facing each other. It's a kind of very lovely uh, picture. And many of them have these bears on either end. Uh, the Brompton ones are particularly famous for having very clear muzzled bears kind of grasping the end of the monument, but you can also see one here. So um, I've said, uh, and once again, like the Norse bells, what's interesting about these, these are not anything that they brought from Scandinavia with them. There's nothing particularly Scandinavian about them. Um, in some cases, they do have uh, obviously Scandinavian ornament on them, but there also is nothing typically English about them. They seem to be a monument that has arisen in, uh, they probably originated in North Yorkshire, so arisen in England in this hybrid culture where of, in the meeting place of Anglo-Saxons and Vikings. Now, uh, slightly controversially, the three or four southernmost hogbacks are found here in the East Midlands. Um, and the one on the left uh, in St. Luke's Church in Hickling, uh, the one on the right um, from in the very small church in Shelton, where there is another one as well. Um, if you remember from the distribution map, they're quite far south compared to the others. Um, and some would argue that these are not true hogbacks. It's true that they don't look very much like uh, the ones I've just shown you from North Yorkshire. Uh, but nevertheless, if you look carefully, uh, the one from Hickling, there is a muzzled bear on the end with two paws grasping the end of the monument. And this end of the monument is damaged, but you can just about make the muzzle of the bear there. So the same idea of a monument also of roughly a similar shape, a similar size, with a bear at either end. Um, and uh, I'm, it's not my argument, it's, a, it's an argument made in uh, the 2016 volume of the Corpus of Anglo-Saxon Stone Sculpture by Paul Everson and David Stocker. They, they discuss all the ins and outs of the case and they propose that these should be regarded as hogbacks or certainly related to hogbacks. So the idea of this kind of monument, um, which is very much concentrated further north, nevertheless, um, people here in the East Midlands are in touch uh, with uh, other people who are interested in making monuments like this. The unusual thing about Hickling, of course, is that it has a whacking great co uh, cross on it. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's not the only, uh, it's not the only hogback with Christian symbolism. There is, for example, in Gosforth, one with a crucifixion on it, um, but I think it's the only one with a cross on it, certainly in that position. So there's this kind of special East Midlands version, perhaps, of, of the hogbacks, showing the links between the East Midlands and the rest of the Viking world, but doing their own thing, making hogbacks in their own style. Um, and there's one in Derby as well. I don't have a photo of the whole thing. It's only a fragment anyway. Um, but here are some nice close-ups. So uh, sculpture in general um, is a very interesting form of evidence for the Viking settlers. They seem to have taken to it in a big way. 
and we have a huge explosion in the habit of uh, monumental sculpture in the Viking period in England. Um, and a lot of this sculpture, again, will have Scandinavian styles on it, Scandinavian type ornament, um, but is not obviously directly borrowed from Scandinavia. And here's another example um, from Bakewell, up in the Peak District. It's just a small fragment. What is uh, immediately noticeable to anyone who's used to looking at these things is that the style of ornament on it is something that we associate with the Irish Sea region. It's not something we associate with the East Midlands at all. Um, this particular Viking Age art style is called the Buddha style. And this is a variant of that Buddha style, um, which uh, is called the ring chain. I always think it's, it looks like a, a whole uh, long list, uh, sequence of Y fronts, actually. <laughs> um, and uh, it is very much found in northern England, especially in the northwest and in the Irish Sea region. Um, and the, the Bakewell monument, it's obviously just a fragment, has been interpreted in this uh, motif on this nice bookmark, which you can get a copy of in the Dane Law Saga exhibition. And you can also see the motif uh, on the walls of that exhibition. And if you compare it um, to the Gosforth Cross, particularly uh, this bit here, here the Y fronts are upside down, um, or this uh, cross shaft from the Isle of Man, uh, you can see very clearly the similarity. So once again, uh, here in the East Midlands, or at least in Derbyshire, um, people are in touch with whatever the latest fashion in monuments is uh, in further away in uh, the Viking world, as particularly in the Irish Sea region. Right, so just these examples, the Norse bells, the hogbacks, and art styles uh, show that people here in the East Midlands were in touch um, with the rest of the Viking world. What happens after the 10th century? After all, in the 10th century, we can still expect there to be connections. Did people still feel connected uh, after the 10th century? It's a very difficult question to answer. Um, and I know of at least three articles written <laughs> within uh, the last 100 years asking the question, how long did the Scandinavian language survive in England? And not one of those articles has managed to answer that question yet. I think the reason uh, they haven't answered the question is because it actually varies enormously in different parts of the country. Um, and it's, certainly if you study um, modern immigrants, it's uh, very clear that um, depending on the circumstances, people can lose their, their mother tongue very quickly uh, if they move somewhere where there's a different language spoken. But um, it depends on various circumstances and so on. So language is one thing. Uh, as these monuments show, it seems uh, that the Vikings converted to Christianity very quickly. Uh, they wouldn't have been Christian when they arrived, uh, but what the monuments suggest is that they, they adopted Christianity, even though uh, something like the Gosforth Cross has scenes from Norse mythology on it. So they're not losing touch with their old culture, but they're also accommodating to the new culture that they're living in. Um, so how, how long does it take to stop feeling Scandinavian um, and to start feeling English, for want of a better word? Well, that's an unanswerable question. But one way we can approach it is to look at what connections there still were beyond this period, beyond the 10th century, uh, when you might imagine that after maybe three generations, they would have been fully assimilated. Um, so I'm going to look at just four topics here. I'm going to look at runes, uh, a bit more sculpture, because it's so much fun, uh, St. Olaf, and that uh, jewel of uh, the East Midlands, the town of Grimsby. <laughs> Apologies, is there anyone from Grimsby in the audience? <laughs> right, runes. Um, the good news is that that uh, place that claims to be the capital of Viking England, York, has no runic inscriptions whatsoever. 
um, the East Midlands, or rather specifically Lincolnshire, has three. So, yay. <laughs> um, runes, uh, briefly, in case you don't know, runes are just an alphabet. They're an alphabet uh, that was used by various groups of people speaking various Germanic languages from at least the second century AD onwards. Um, they show some similarities to the Roman alphabet, but they are a separate alphabet. And they can be used to write any language whatsoever. Um, and they were in continuous, but they were most commonly used in Scandinavia. The earliest runic inscriptions found from the second century AD are from Scandinavia. And in some parts of Scandinavia, the alphabet was still being used in the 1500s. So they're a long lasting form of writing. Now, the Anglo Saxons also had their own version of the runic alphabet. Um, it's very easy most of the time to distinguish between the two. And the Anglo Saxons uh, had kind of slowed down and more or less stopped writing in runes by approximately the 10th century, um, apart from various antiquarians who uh, wrote about them as a, a kind of long gone phenomenon. What, but what happens in the Viking Age? is that Scandinavians come in and bring their runic alphabet, which they use to write their language. Um, and we find there are, is a grand total at the moment of 19 Scandinavian runic inscriptions in England. It's not very many, but I'm sure more will be found, because they are being found still. Um, and they are extremely interesting, because they show people using the language here. Now this. Um, you can see this in the exhibition over the, uh, that way, <laughs> the Viking Rediscover the Legend exhibition. This is a comb case found in Lincoln quite some time ago. Um, I also have one I made earlier here, or sorry, rather my, my wonderful friend Adam of Blue Axe Reproductions made it. Um, and just to show you, because that's all that's left at the moment, um, there's a, a case. Uh, and with a pull-out comb, uh, for comb. And because the teeth are a bit fragile, uh, they make a case. And then you can put this little thing in to stop it falling out uh, when you carry it around with you. This is made of some kind of bone, uh, probably large animal bone, probably a cow. I don't really know. Um, and here is, as you can see, uh, an inscription in runes, which has the, um, what I love about studying runic inscriptions is the banality of many of the texts. <laughs> Thorfast made a good comb. Okay, uh, who was Thorfast? Where did he make this comb? I mean, a comb is obviously a highly portable object and probably most of you have one on you. Um, so if you suddenly went off to uh, New Zealand tomorrow, you'd take one with you. So it's perfectly possible that this was not made in Lincoln. It might have been made somewhere else and brought uh, to Lincoln by a traveler. And why did Thorfast feel the need um, to write, uh, to boast about his comb-making abilities on this comb? Well, it could have been just to remind uh, the comb owner to go back there next time he needed another comb. Um, or he might have been just been uh, practicing his runes, or who knows what uh, the explanation is. It's wonderful to speculate and to kind of think what stories lie behind these objects. Um, so there you go. That's uh, one of the three Lincolnshire runic inscriptions. Uh, this one, I say, could have been imported. The other two, I think, are almost certainly made <coughs> in Lincolnshire. Uh, the second one is also from Lincoln and can be seen in the Danelaw Saga exhibition. This um, is also a piece of bone, um, but not one that was fashioned into any kind of object. It's just uh, probably the remainder of someone's roast beef dinner. Again, it's a cow bone. Um, and it's broken, so we don't have the whole inscription. And we don't really understand what it's meant to say. We can read the runes, uh, and it says, Hethir Stin. And because the Viking Age runic alphabet only had 16 characters, uh, sometimes the messages are a bit obscure. So it either means that someone is called a stone, 
or someone is called Stain, which means stone but is also a man's name, or it means that someone heats the stone. You take your pick. I don't, <laughs> I have absolutely no idea. Um, but what's interesting, uh, several things interesting about it, it's very kind of ephemeral use of runes. You're sitting around after dinner, what do you do to amuse yourself? Well, you sit around and carve messages on bones and send them around the room. And we have plenty of examples of that from both the Viking Age and the medieval period. Um, it's also written in different runes from uh, the comb case. If you look, you can see at the end of the name of Thorfast, there's an S um, and a T. The S looks a bit like RS, it's just like a lightning kind of thing. Um, and there's a T with two branches, one either side. Um, in this, uh, the S is just that short line there, and the T next to it only has one branch. So there are slightly there are variations uh, in the in the runic alphabet used by people, and this might be because uh, the rune carver came from a different part of Scandinavia, or there might be a, a date thing there. I think this is probably from the 11th century. So I think in the 11th century, we still have people in Lincoln who can speak Scandinavian and write Scandinavian runes. Um, the third Lincolnshire runic inscription was found in 2010 um, by a metal detectorist and has only just received uh, in 2017 a preliminary write-up uh, by Professor John Hines at Cardiff. I think there's a lot more still to be said about it, um, which I hope to do myself soon. Um, so, but I think it's, it's extremely mysterious, um, and there are lots of interesting questions it raises which we don't know the answer to yet. Um, first of all, the object itself, I'm sure some of you recognize what it is. Spindle whirl, yes. So it's a little thing used for spinning wool. So an object normally associated with women. Um, it's, the original is made of lead. By the way, you can see a reproduction of it in the Danelaw Saga exhibition, again, made by our great friend Blue Axe Reproductions. Um, and it, it is quite small, as you can see from that photo on the left. Um, the inscription has been interpreted as uh, saying, Odin and Heimdallr and Thjalfa, they help you, Ulfliot, and then there's a bit that we don't understand. Um, Ulfliot might be a woman's name, might be the name of the person who owned this. Um, it seems to be an invocation to that great god of Norse mythology, Odin, and possibly also Heimdall, the watchman of the gods. Um, I'm a little bit suspicious about it, and there are some problems about the dating. It seems, at any rate, to probably not be earlier than the 11th century, um, and could be possibly a little bit later. Um, and that would be very surprising. Now, why would someone in Christian Lincolnshire invoke the name of the god Odin in the 11th century? Uh, well, I have no idea, um, but I think it raises important and interesting questions about what's actually going on. Saltfleet B is a small place uh, near the coast, um, and it may, um, I think, as I say, there's still lots more to be found out about this uh, inscription in, the, in particular. Um, but there's the bit where it says Odin. And again, the rune forms differ slightly from those of the other two inscriptions as well. So again, there are chronological uh, and possibly uh, geographical implications in uh, these rune forms and who wrote them, uh, where they came from, and why they're writing these runes. Another great mystery. Um, this is the kind of thing that keeps me going. Um, this is my life's work, working these things out. Right. Um, I'm must get on. Uh, I mentioned Viking art styles earlier. Um, another art style I want to mention is the so-called Urnes style, um, which 
is the last of the Viking. When we talk about Viking art styles, there's a kind of sequence of them from Bore, Mamen, Jelling, Ringerike, and Urnes. So Urnes is very much the end of the Viking Age. It's an art style that began in the 11th century and moves on into the 12th century. And here's a nice little object in the British Museum um, found in Lincolnshire. Uh, if you can see, it's a snake. There's its head, uh, and its body goes around like that, and it's biting itself, um, and there's its tail. Um, and so Unas is characterized by th these more or less figure eight shape shapes, and uh, this alternation of narrow bands with broader bands of interlace. And we find uh, we do find there are two extremely interesting examples of it in Nottinghamshire, which I'm sure um, many of you are familiar with. First of all, the Southall lintel, uh, now in the cathedral, or the, sorry, the minster. Um, and you can see that Urnes style. This is St. Michael in the middle, and then he's fighting the dragon. And you can see that Urnes style in that vaguely figure of eight shape in the broad and the narrow bands. Uh, it was long thought that this might be pre-conquest, um, but now uh, the latest opinion by art historians is this was probably made. Uh, in fact, I, I, I forget the details of how they did this, but they've narrowed it down to the period between 1110 and 1120. So there you have it. So in the early 12th century, um, stonemasons in Nottinghamshire are using this uh, Scandinavian art style uh, in their work. And similarly, uh, the tympanum at Hoveringham nearby and probably coming, possibly coming from Southall also originally. Um, again, same kind of dragon. There's another one down here. Now the Urnes style, now art styles can travel. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that people are directly in touch with uh, the Scandinavian homelands where this art style was very common and, and very highly developed. But I think it's significant that if you have a place like Nottinghamshire, where you have uh, a history of Scandinavian occupation, that uh, they are more receptive um, to uh, the, the latest fashions from Scandinavia. And there's also a lot of very simple versions of the Urnes style, like some of these uh, recent metal detectorist finds. I have to admit, I'm not an art historian, so I think you need the, to be, have the trained eye, really, to see that these are Urnes. But I'm told they're Unes, so I believe them. Right, um, St. Olaf, um, king of Norway, died in battle in the year 1030. The extraordinary thing about Olaf is that already by 20 years within his death, he has a cult in England. Um, he's the first royal saint of Scandinavia, uh, and he is popular throughout England. It's not just, I think, because of uh, the Viking connection, but of course that 11th century period, it's soon after the reign of Knut, um, there is still a lot of contact between Scandinavia and England. And we have, um, in Lincolnshire, we have this small church near Louth um, dedicated to him, and also the, uh, uh, the Abbey of Wellow near Grimsby, I'm getting to Grimsby. Um, and these are later medieval seals. But you can see on this one, the left-hand figure is a bishop. But the right-hand figure uh, has a crown and an axe. Um, and in medieval hagiography, a guy with a crown and an axe is almost always Saint Olaf. Um, he's uh, the, ba the warrior king, if you like. And indeed, here's a very nice picture of him from Norway showing him very clearly with the crown and the axe, and in this case, a little globe as well. So St. Olaf became very popular, but again, I think there is uh, a connection. He was particularly popular in those parts of the country uh, that had Scandinavian connections. Um, right, two last bits. Um, Rory said, I like poetry, so we've got to have some poetry here. Um, and I think uh, one of the things you might notice in the Dane Law Saga exhibition is there are bits of poetry on the walls. People forget uh, that the Vikings really, really liked poetry. 
Uh, a former colleague of mine once wrote that the Vikings were ruffians, but they were cultured ruffians. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that this kind of lives on in the Icelandic sagas and in all the great literary achievements of the Scandinavian peoples. So I'm first of all, going to look at um, an Earl of Orkney. Um, Rögnvaldr was born in Norway, but his mother was from Orkney. Orkney at this time was still a part of the Norwegian Empire, um, and he eventually succeeded to the earldom of Orkney in spite of being Norwegian. Um, but in his youth, before he did that, he, he came to Grimsby. Uh, he later on won fame um, through leading a crusade to the Holy Land in the 1150s. Um, and then after that, I'll look at a, a Middle English poem. So the young Earl Rungwald of Orkney visits Grimsby in the 1140s. Uh, you, can, you, you can hear this read on one of the telephones in the Dane Law Saga exhibition in Old Norse. Um, you can, he didn't really like Grimsby. <laughs> Um, it was very, very muddy, and actually I've looked into this. At the time, Grimsby was a bit of an island in a marsh, and they, as they came by boat, he came, he traveled with some merchants. He was a young man on an internship, I think is what was happening to him, and they, they had to anchor out at sea and then wade through these marshes to do their trading in the town of Grimsby, and the poem is all about how happy he was uh, to be sailing back to Bergen um, across the sea and get out of poor old muddy Grimsby. Um, okay, so he didn't like Grimsby much and he didn't stay there for very long, but um, I think it's interesting that there are these strong connections. The Norwegian merchants he was traveling with were trading regularly in Grimsby um, and Grimsby still had that connection. So my final example is a, is a perhaps more um, flattering account of Grimsby in this uh, Middle English poem called Havelock the Dane, um, written in Lincolnshire just before 1300, probably in the late 13th century. It's, it's a romance. It's a story of uh, poor boy makes good, except poor boy isn't really poor boy. Poor boy was actually originally uh, a king's son anyway. So Havelock is a Danish prince. His father is killed by a usurper. The usurper imprisons Havelock and his two little sisters. It's a very sad story. The little sisters get killed, but Havelock is rescued by a kindly peasant called Grimm, um, and they have to escape uh, the tyranny of this usurper. So uh, Grimm takes the whole family, including Havelock, over to England and founds the town of Grimsby, which is named after him. Um, and then Havelock, through a whole series of adventures, eventually realizes his true uh, uh, level in society, marries an English princess, and, and becomes king of England. Um, and it's, uh, you can read this poem in many ways, but I think one important thing it is doing, in the late 13th century, uh, an audience in Lincolnshire still remembers that some of their origins are in Denmark. And the poem is about that integration of the two cultures. Havelock marries an English princess, and everyone lives happily ever after. So English and Danish come together, and this is what makes Lincolnshire special and makes uh, the prince uh, appropriate to become king of the whole of England. And uh, again, you can hear this read on the telephones in the Dane Law Saga exhibition. This is the passage um, which shows Grimm arriving. Um, and I'll just point out, the stead of Grimm the name lotus, so that Grimm is be it, calleth Allah that thereof spake in Allah. The place got its name from Grimm, so that everyone who speaks of it calls it Grimsby. And it's true, we think, we don't know that whether there was a, there must have been a real Grimm. Um, we do know that that is how the name came about. It is the bee, the town, or the estate, or the farm of someone called Grimm. Um, so there's a little bit of kind of place name uh, expertise in this poem. And indeed, there is a medieval seal, and you can see it in the Dane Law exhibition. Uh, the, the, t the seal of the town of Grimsby has, uh, it's Grimm in the middle there, uh, dressed more or less as a Viking warrior with his uh, shield and sword 
To the left of him is Havelock, to the right is Goldborough, the princess, and all of them are named on the seal as well. So and this is uh, a modern wax copy, but uh, the original seal uh, is from the Middle Ages. So already in the Middle Ages, at the same time perhaps as the poem is being written, people are remembering the origins of Grimsby um, as coming from this Danish uh, fisherman, really, called Grim. <coughs> So that ends my little tour of various interesting bits of evidence which show the place of the East Midlands in the Viking world. Um, and just to come back to this map, um, I'd like to kind of throw this map out <laughs> and think of things, and I haven't yet uh, figured out how to express what I think in, a, in another map, I will one day, uh, but I'd like to suggest a new word uh, that we use when thinking about the Viking Age. Viking Age isn't just about migration. It isn't just about the physical movement of people from one place to another and uh, where they take stuff with them and then just plonk it down and stay there. It's not a one-directional thing. It's uh, what we might call diaspora. It's the consciousness of being connected to the people and traditions, both of your homeland, wherever you came from, whether it's Denmark or Norway, but also with other people, whether they're in Scotland or Iceland or the Isle of Man who are of the same origin as you. So there is, the Viking Age was a very mobile time. Uh, the people who settled in these different parts of the Viking world were in touch with each other because they were mobile. Uh, and therefore, I think the Viking Age qualifies as being called a diaspora. Thank you very much. <laughs>